I am Deborah Gross. I am the city councilwoman for District 7 in the city of Pittsburgh, and I chair at city council the um, Intergovernmental Affairs Committee. I've been on council more than eight years. I'm coming up on nine full years in office, which I cannot believe. Um, and um, so I really started off my tenure at council talking about vacant properties. Um, and be, probably because I had worked with a lot of the community development corporations before I got elected, and it was really on their minds, and it's been a struggle for a long time. Um, so one of the first things I did at council was introduce land bank legislation. Um, which we passed early in 2014. The first thing that a lot of people don't realize is that we lost half of our people in the city of Pittsburgh. So all of our streets, all of our infrastructure, our water system, and, and our land was used to be occupied, and it's abandoned. Um, so we honestly have about 14,000 parcels the people just walked away from, and they're long gone. Some of them, they walked away 30, 40 years ago. Um, and so we've taken control of the property under what's called treasurer's sale in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and then we've done nothing with it. So literally the population went from around 600,000 or so people, and today it's just barely 300,000. So half of our people are gone, and so half of our landmass isn't occupied really. So in the city, there's about 140 different parcels of like private property carved out, right, with like property boundaries. Mm -hmm. And an easy 10% of that, the 14,000 parcels, have like the city of Pittsburgh's name on it. The problem is that there's the liens, the debts on them, the back property taxes or the back school board taxes, those were never paid off. Right, well, if you're thinking about land that's off somewhere else that's not near you, it's easier to just not worry about it and not think about what that is. But if it's the vacant property across you that's a physical hazard because it's falling down, that it has pests in it or litter or the weeds are overgrown, it's really what is a source of problems for you in your livelihood, right? So if you've got rats in the neighborhood, I hate to bring it up, but it's a, that's true, right? Or even just criminal activity, because it's a, a lot that no one's taking care of and it's just kind of open for anybody's use, that's a problem. But also if like you're the last house, I've seen these streets in the city of Pittsburgh, right? You've got like one house, maybe it's your family house that you've been in for decades and the whole rest of your block to either side of you, you have no neighbors, right? And so, and then the, because those properties have no value, it brings down your property value. So while it might have had value and it might have been a great street to live on 30, 40 years ago, now you've really, you're really struggling to have any value in your property. And so it, that's a loss of that generational wealth that I think we all need to be concerned about. You can actually overlay the maps. Most of us have heard of redlining, and we know that insurers and underwriters generations ago said, hey, this is the white part of the city that's good to invest in, and this is the literally black people cloned parts of the city that are not good to invest in. And we've tried for decades to put policies in place to level that playing field and to undo that damage. Uh, but there's so many ways that are kind of just still entrenched in the system that reinforce those inequities. And you can overlay in the city of Pittsburgh the maps of where there's blight and abandonment and where those redlining neighborhoods used to be, and they overlay really closely. So we, we obviously, even if there were good intentions along the way, the policies really haven't worked. You know, it's been a problem for a long time. Again, decades that we've been kind of stuck in this situation of like, oh my gosh, there are all these vacant parcels out there. What do we do? How do we get them back into productive use, community control? Um, when we had the debate at the beginning of 2014 for months at the, at the council table, and you can look back on the local media at the time, um, I, I think what we should be doing as a city is putting it back into people's 
control in that neighborhood. And um, I, I said at the time, and I still say, I, I don't care if you want to do a community garden on that piece of property. I don't care if you want to put in a basketball hoop. I don't care if you want to have just, you know, a little kid's tot lot playground. Um, or, and certainly, we, need, we know we need more affordable housing in the city, right? Um, but we just haven't done the work to make clear the legal backlog on these lots in order for you to be able to make use of them or even to step onto them. For the longest time, we weren't even letting people onto them to clean them up or reuse them or reoccupy them. Because, so we were the barrier. Um, and so we put the land bank into place and unfortunately, it's been eight years and it literally hasn't processed a single property. It's got one property that it cleared legally, but it hasn't found a buyer for. Um, and that's, that's really unfortunate because we intended for it to be the more streamlined way so that we could do better than we had been doing. Um, and this gets a bit wonky and it's kind of a, a bit of a deep dive, but I had an intern this past semester go back and look at, well, what are the other ways we can do this work? Right? So even if it would be great if our land bank was up and running and doing more than we could do with the city departments, um, that doesn't mean we should stop doing it with the city departments. So what I think we should start doing is just doing what we already have the tools to do. Mm -hmm. And so you know, back in 2014, there were 120 properties that were put into people's hands from our own like auctions, mm -hmm. right? our treasurer sale auctions. Um, and last year, there were none. And the year before that, there were none. And the year before that, there were none. So it's really, it really trailed off. And if we had kept that up, we would have moved 1,000 properties by now, mm -hmm. which would be better than you know, just a, a handful. So we can do that. There's another thing that the city had done really robustly and has not done for the last several years, which is the property reserve. It's a separate kind of ordinance. You're really still just doing the title clearing with our own real estate department and our own law department. Mm -hmm. But we work really closely with the community organizations to say, hey, do you get a plan for this lot or you get a plan for that lot? Whatever it is, you know, work it out kind of amongst yourselves. I think the ordinance says there could be up to 250 set aside. Mm -hmm. And that set aside is important because it legally keeps it away from the speculators that we see getting control of our lots now. Mm -hmm. And I think we should make sure that we mention that. Like, it's not um, t 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, outside money interests, from private equity companies to LLCs and investors of all kinds, are getting these properties, mm -hmm. even if we haven't cleared title because they're using a different tool called conservatorship. So while these lots used to kind of be, um, you know, out of reach of our neighbors, and that was bad. Now it's even worse. We've kept them out of reach of our neighbors, but they're still accessible to big money interests that have attorneys. Yep. And that's not okay. That's not okay. And so we really do need to be more creative to, to make sure we change that. And I think one of the ways we do that is that we do it at the city council table. And we, we start looking really hard at these parcels one by one. Um, I've gone through the list of the abandoned properties in my district. It's very short. You know, as we all know, the district I represent has had a lot of real estate investment and there really aren't any abandoned properties left. But I've also helped some of the other council members go through their list. Um, so District 7 has their list and is, or District 4 is going through their list. And I've uh, given it also the council president, District 2. And I really think we ought to just kind of make it public, go through it and have a discussion about what needs to happen where. Oh, well, okay, so the thing that makes me really enthusiastic about residents controlling this property and being able to steward it and hopefully having a path to ownership and control is for exactly the reason I was just talking about. We have external interests, external speculators, private equity companies from Chicago, from San Francisco, from New York, real estate investment trusts, foreign investors even from overseas. Um, who are able to go through our properties and have the money and again the lawyers and the cash to just kind of make sure that they're gobbling up our properties. That's their goal, right? That doesn't help our city in the long run. 
it does not help our residents. It harms us because our wealth is getting sucked out of the city. Um, and we, it makes us stronger and it makes our future stronger if we keep that wealth local. Um, I like to define the word equity, um, which we all agree is a great goal, but how do we know it when we see it? And I like to ask if you know we have ownership and control. And if our residents have ownership and control, then I feel that that's more equitable than if they do not. Um, so we need to make sure that we retain the local ownership because it can help with local wealth building. And that's, I think, what the goal of the city should be. Yes, yes, exactly. What we know that we've done really badly for the last 10 years, because we just got our US Census results, is push even more black and brown people out of the city of Pittsburgh. East Liberty, where we sit near right now, gained 1,600 white residents in the last 10 years and lost 650 black residents at the same time. And it's not because it's such a terrible neighborhood. If it was such a terrible neighborhood, why did 1,600 wealthy white people move in? And, and you can see from the home values, there are homes going for a million dollars right now listed on Zillow in East Liberty, right? And so that's not our goal, right? So that is not a sustainable future for the city. So having that we, it's just such an injustice that we have this affordable housing crisis. Rents are too high, purchase prices are too high for houses, and we had all of this vacant property that we didn't build housing on, that could have been housing for the people who are at lower incomes and, and need to create wealth. Like, like it or not, it's still the a path to wealth building in the United States is, is home ownership. One of the most promising things I think that can get us past that hurdle is both the land trust that we've seen for creating affordable housing because it makes the purchase, the entry price lower. Um, we know that they're marketing them to households at 80% AMI and so people are able to buy in. But most importantly with the permanent affordability land trust is that they're, they sell out at a price that's still affordable. They can build equity but because of the restrictions on the deeds, there's only a kind of nice steady graph of sales price that's allowed, around 5%, maybe a little more, not the kind of skyrocketing flipper price differences that we've seen. Mm -hmm. A second thing is a topic that we're talking about at council. I introduced a legislation with um, Councilwoman Smith earlier this year to explore limited equity housing co-ops because that's a way that people can buy in by shares. So it's an even lower threshold to start equity building and wealth building, that you can just kind of buy one, like start with your payments that are at a level of rent and, and still have stable household while you build up your equity in the house and not need to be housing insecure while you're trying to save up that down payment, um, which is the conundrum that so many people are in. Um, and, and we know we have the areas to do that because we have these vacant properties. And again, the city of Pittsburgh's name is on the deed. The, the problem that we have is either taking them through treasurer sale or clearing those titles and paying off the back lien some other way. So that's, that's the policy challenge. It's, I think, a place where um, Instead of treating each of ourselves as kind of like individuals whose fates are just unconnected to each other, that really collective ownership and collective control is a way that we build connections to each other and it can really be a supportive network for that kind of increasing equity and increasing wealth. But it also increases power, right? So that you have a collective ownership, You're, you have control of even more of the land as a collective than you do as an individual. Um, so I, I see that some other cities are putting some of their funds towards that. I was just looking at um, the uh, Phoenix, Arizona fund, food fund that they've created, and I was really happy to see that they are supporting and focusing on worker collectives and worker cooperatives in their, um, in their support with those funds. We're hopefully also creating a food justice fund here in Pittsburgh. The mayor's proposed $3 million. I've been hosting um, press conferences and, and public hearings on it. 
And I would really like to see us do some of that same investment. So if, you know, imagine we already see some groups starting agricultural collectives like bugs. And so it pre creates a mutual um, network for sharing resources and kind of improving skill sets and just increasing success in any, each one of the individual endeavors. We talked about that, um, again, as something that a land bank could do. I've seen other local organizations step into this, this gap, and often people call it tangled title, mm -hmm. where you might have, you know, I might be living in my grandmother's house, but did we ever do the paperwork, mm -hmm. right? And so do I actually, am I actually rightfully on that deed, or could someone kick me out of it? And it's, it creates vulnerability in um, our less resourced neighborhoods especially. And I think that's, again, something we'd hope the land bank would do, but if it's not going to do that, we, we are looking to partners like Neighborhood Legal Services, and um, we're about to create, um, with Housing Opportunity Fund funding, um, a kind of lawyer for the day and legal assistance fund, so that people who don't have access to the it's really lawyers who can guide you. I wouldn't know personally how to do this stuff, right? But a lawyer shouldn't be out of my reach, right, as a city of Pittsburgh resident, especially when we're talking about securing control over family estates and family wealth. Even if it's modest wealth, it's still family wealth that we want to make sure people don't lose. I think we're struggling to figure that out right now. I'm really excited that our city planning director, Karen Abrams, is also looking to see how our city planning departments can use just transition as a framework. Mm -hmm. um, so she's working on a comprehensive plan, um, which we haven't had for a long time. So it's like we have little neighborhood plans, some of them aren't official, some of them are, but how do they all fit together? So, you know. If, you're, if your neighborhood creates a plan for itself, that doesn't mean your neighborhood is gonna be able to make sure that it's on a transit network or that it has access to food and job centers. But if we have comprehensive, that's, that's the job of the city, to make sure that we don't leave you and your neighborhood on an island without resources. Like it's, that's why cities have land use control, so that we can make sure that what we do doesn't disadvantage and um, create your neighborhood and where you live or create those inequities that it'd be impossible for you, even with collective power, even if we got to collective ownership, you still wouldn't be able to wrangle with the transit system effectively, right? And, but we have the power to do that with city land use power and city planning. So I think it's really important for us at City Council to keep that in front of us. What would the outcomes be? The outcomes would be that where you are and where you're in your neighborhood is and where these, um, you know, if we get land back into community power, that they would have access to job centers, access to the kinds of things that people need on a daily basis to survive, I like to say, which is like, not just food, but like daycares and drugstores and um, dentists, right? That we, that we invest our um, land use planning and city resources so that we don't leave any of the places that our residents are living without access to the things they need. I could talk about this for like a whole other half hour. So we have been thinking a lot about this in my office for the last couple of years. Um, and thank you to Grounded for helping us with resources in our early stages. I think you helped at a point when we had a panic over getting lead soil tests for a brand new collective community farm in Polish Hill. And that in the early days of the pandemic when we were all still in quarantine and it was really, really helpful because that farm has grown now it's been two years in, I think it's three seasons, and it has um, been farmed collectively and has donated food every week to hungry households in the city of Pittsburgh. And it's created a model. We've taken the mayor there. Um, 
We've taken members of his administration, the director of DPW there, the director of Parks and Rec there, and it has um, helped us as a city expand our programming. So investing in green spaces, I think, has allowed us all to kind of imagine that we could have hillsides that aren't full of invasives that are pulling down the trees and resulting in multi-million dollar landslides that we have to fix. What if we bioremediated the hillsides first so that we didn't have that loss, right? Uh, what if we had more local food production so that we had, um, you know, not to imagine a future where we're just all existing on corporate big box food. I'm trying not to name specific big boxes, but you know, there are places that are trying to control agriculture and our access to foods. It means um, reinvesting in soil that does not just carbon capture, but improves stormwater capture. Again, these are, stormwater is a multi-billion dollar problem that we're spending as a county several billion dollars on. Um, under federal order, unfortunately. But if we had started by greening, um, we might have been able to bring that price tag down. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of potential. You have a right to your land and you have a right to control it. And it's our job to help you get there. Awesome. All right, perfect. <laughs>